Our next panel is entitled Rebranding Psychedelics. And, uh, oh, Dave, where are you? How's that? Better? Yeah. Thank you. Um, our next panel is entitled Rebranding Psychedelics. I'm not going to give a full bio for each of these guys because I don't want to eat into their time. But Brad Burge, who is the um, uh, moderator, uh, says he believes in the importance of communication for sharing knowledge and building community and is committed to helping people develop honest and responsible relationships with themselves, each other, and their pharmacological tools. What a nice segue to our last presentation. Michael Levine is the communication director of the Hefter Research Institute. Sasha Frost is the content manager for the Beckley Foundation. Bryce Montgomery serves as content manager at MAPS, a position that combines all of his passions, ranging from using the internet to reaching people worldwide to creating visually stimulating media projects. And Don Latin is an award-winning journalist, the author of six books, and his new work, Changing Our Minds, Psychedelic Sacraments and the New Psychotherapy, was published this spring and is available downstairs in the marketplace. Welcome to you all. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, it's an honor to be up here today and it's just an amazing conference, so many amazing connections and thank you all for coming up. Um, today's panel um, follows up on a 2013 panel um, at Psychedelic Science 2013 um, that we hosted um, called uh, Repositioning Psychedelics in the Public Mind. Um, during the course of that conversation, this term rebranding kept coming up and of course there's a lot of ways we can think about how our concepts individually and as a culture are, are shifting um, as far as understanding what psychedelics are, uh, what is a psychedelic, even just the terminology, psychedelic, hallucinogen, entheogen, and pathogen, all of these have different subtle meanings and we're still sussing them apart. Um, you know, there's also the different optics for, for how psychedelics are being seen. I think one of the major thing that MAPS and Hefter and uh, the, the, the Beckley Foundation and um, many of the other organizations, um, fast growing number of organizations and groups and media outlets and individuals who are promoting psychedelics um, are starting to think about um, how we're framing psychedelics from a, um, from a point of view that um, helps us think about large numbers of people and reaching large numbers of people and what happens when we're no longer just kind of trying to do research in the underground and trying to communicate to large numbers of people who are coming from many, many different points of view all over the world about what psychedelics are and how can we communicate about them. So that's the general um, gist of this panel. Um, we have four just amazing uh, humans who have all been working in different um, on, on rebranding psychedelics uh, in, in different ways uh, from, from different angles. Um, so I just wanted to um, give a brief introduction there. Um, I was also um, in the, the, the Fundamental uh, Partner Forum yesterday and uh, also the Bicycle Day Ventures Partner Forum today and the conversations there, um, both of which uh, are, are forums from our conference partners who are helping support this conference financially and also helping support uh, this work by bringing innovative ideas about how to reach large numbers of people through crowdfunding um, or through investments um, or, or other ways. And so a lot of that conversation is about how are we going to reach uh, large numbers of new people um, and how can we inspire uh, more support from large numbers of people. So uh, without further ado, I just want to um, start us off. Um, I think um, I think we have uh, uh, Don, actually, yeah, Don starting us off. Don has been working um, uh, 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 three, or uh, rather, uh, four out of five of us are um, media professionals, so PR, marketing, um, communications. Don is um, actually on the journalistic side um, and has experience there. So um, I just want to start us off, and thank you so much for joining us, Don. It's an honor to have you here. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for coming up to this wonderful uh, view of my hometown, Oakland, California. I've lived here for decades, and uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, uh, my, as you said, my, my uh, role on the panel is to talk about the rebranding of psychedelics from a journalist's perspective. As someone who's been writing about these magical mystery compounds in newspapers, magazines, and several books over, I almost hate to admit it, 40 years. <laughs> Um, but in addition to being a newspaper reporter, I'm also a human being. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. 
the reporter part didn't get any applause, but the human being part did. So I'll, I'll take whatever I can get. Uh, and I say that because uh, despite what Donald, Donald Trump's demonizing rants about the so-called dishonest media, uh, journalist and human being are not mutually exclusive categories. Uh, I have not only written about psychedelics for many years, over the past 50 years, starting I think around age 13, so you can do the math, <laughs> I've had my own ecstasies and agonies with various entheogens, intactogens, and various other uh, euphorients, which I write about a bit in some of my books. Uh, my new book, and I mean new, it's out this week, is titled, and that's the cover, Changing Our Minds, Psychedelic Sacraments and the New Psychotherapy. And in it, I try to tell the human stories of the scientists, the therapists, the researchers, and ordinary people, myself included, uh, seeking psychological growth and spiritual insight through the uh, wise use of psychoactive drugs and sacred plant medicines. I mean, you could say my book in like five words is about the rebranding of psychedelics. Um, I mean, there must be two dozen people roaming the halls here this weekend that are in the book who I interviewed for, for the book. So it's very strange having this book just come out and all these people, some of whom haven't read it yet, <laughs> are, are, are coming up to me and saying, is your book out yet? Yeah, it's right there. So, <laughs> um, One of the first reviews I got of the book started out by saying this, quote, journalist Don Latin wants to change public opinion of such substances as LSD, ecstasy, and ayahuasca. And I have to admit that I'm a bit uncomfortable being put in that role. Uh, I mean, I'm obviously sympathetic to the MAPS uh, crusade, but as a journalist, I don't think it's my job to rebrand psychedelics. I mean, my job is more telling the stories of people who are trying to rehabilitate these treatments. And, and in my book and in my uh, articles too, I also feel it's my job to highlight some of the big debates and disagreements, some of them rather uh, extreme <laughs> within the community about whether, for instance, double-blind placebo-controlled studies really make any sense. Is that really the best way to go? There's a huge debate over that. Uh, or, uh, you know, whether uh, uh, people trying to get the federal government to reschedule MDA and psilocybin should tell the whole story about what they're up to uh, should they be open about whether they're for outright legalization? Should they be open about talking about their own experiences? And this is, of course, an individual thing among researchers, but there's uh, quite an interesting debate about that going on right now, as I'm sure many of you know. Uh, let's just start first by talking about the word rebranding. It implies there's a problem, doesn't it, with the public's perception of these drugs. Uh, it, it also implies that psychedelics are just another consumer product to be bought and sold in the marketplace, you know, along with you know, natural food, yoga mats, and personal growth workshops. Step into the marketplace hall where people are peddling various things, including me, of course, <laughs> trying to sell my book. Um, so as, as many of you know, the, serious, the first wave of serious research into psychedelics began in the 1950s and continued into the mid-1970s. Now, there are lots of reasons for the 20-year gap in the search for beneficial medical uses of psychedelics. The easy answer to this is that what went wrong? Well, it was Timothy Leary. No, it was Ken Kesey. No, it was Richard Nixon. Uh, it was Nancy Reagan. It was over-exuberant hippies. Uh, all this stuff uh, prompted this uh, backlash in the 1980s. Well, all that is true to a, up to a point, but I think it's more complicated than that. Um, you can also blame the United States Army and the CIA, for instance, which was up to its ears in nefarious psychedelic research throughout the 1950s and 1960s. And this weaponization of psychedelics involved inhumane, sometimes horribly inhumane, human trials where into all kinds of things, whether LSD could be sprayed on enemy troops as a kind of weapon of mass distraction. Um, <laughs> I mean, my favorite CIA plot was the setting up of a brothel just across the bay in San Francisco where customers were dosed with LSD-laced swizzle sticks and filmed through two-way mirrors with the prostitutes. This really happened. <laughs> this was funded by the federal government. And of course, <laughs> these, these, these guys never knew they'd been dosed, so who knows what happened to them. I don't think there was a, a much integration or follow-up uh, in, in, in those studies. <laughs> okay, slide two. Okay. I said I've been writing about this for 40 years. Here's proof. This is 1977. Front page of the Sunday Examiner and Chronicle, they were combined then. The horror of Army's LSD tests. That was my story. 
1977, 40 years ago. Um, I think I was 23 years old. This was, I think, my first big front page story uh, of my career at the San Francisco Examiner. And uh, so it really has been 40 years. I'd kind of forgotten about this story till I, and then I, it was really hard to find it because it's, it's before the databases, you know, I had to, you know, I found it. Um, so this was back in the day when people actually read newspapers, for one thing, and believed what they read. Um, uh, and it's a story about how newly, newly discovered uh, US intelligence agency reports from back in 1951 that the Soviets had purchased 50 million doses of LSD from uh, Sandoz lab in Switzerland, which they had, uh, kicked off this bizarre series of army tests, some of which I just mentioned, including the psychedelic torture of a young African-American soldier, which is, who is the focus of this story, who was falsely accused of being a spy and interrogated as part of this uh, test called Operation Third Chance, where they, uh, they, the army interrogated both enemy soldiers and their own soldiers, again, unknowingly. Um, uh, psychedelic drugs and plants have been getting some better press <laughs> in recent times. Um, as many of you know, the two leading sponsors of this, MAPS and the Hefter Research Institute, have had a wave of very positive media coverage in recent months and years. Let's start with a couple examples. Um, I'm sure Mike is very familiar with this story, and uh, this was a front. This is the this is the web version uh, of uh, the front. But on the on the print paper, it was the front page of the New York Times on December 1st, 2016, just last December. The headline here is "A Dose of Hallucinogen from Magic Mushroom, Then Lasting Peace." This was just last month's Rolling Stone. The psychedelic miracle. Now, this is part of what I just came up with this called the canonization of psychedelic cures. Canonization, if you're not familiar with Roman Catholic theology, is when you make someone a saint, you canonize them. The, 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 the idea that we can have lasting peace or miracles from a single dose of MDMA or psilocybin now, at first glance, this overly optimistic coverage, or at least headlines, may seem like a good thing, but I'm not so sure in a way. I hope I'm wrong, but uh, psychedelic science may be setting itself up for the fall, from the fall from grace. As someone who spent my life working for a major metropolitan newspaper, I have seen how media coverage turns on a dime. Uh, we love to build them up and knock them down. And I hope I'm wrong, but I just, think there's going to be a, a shift. I hope I'm wrong, but I think there might be a shift in this coverage. Um, I noticed this in the, in the writing about ayahuasca um, following the scandalous cover-up of a, the death of a young man at a shamanic center in Peru a few years back. Uh, there's been a lot more attention to the dark side of drug tourism in Peru since that, that story, which in my opinion is a very good thing. Uh, that was not fake news. That really happened. A, a guy died and they tried to cover it up and secretly bury his body and didn't tell his 18-year-old kid from, from Northern California, didn't tell his parents. It was a horrific thing. It was, they didn't want bad press. No one's exactly sure why the guy died. The kid died. Maybe he fell and broke his neck or something. But anyway, uh, that's you know, one of the reasons I decided to put that story in my book is I think it's a cautionary tale about what can happen when we're, when we're not careful in using these compounds. Um, so uh, there are some researchers in the mainstream above ground therapy movement have started issuing quiet warnings about this media honeymoon that may be coming to an end. Uh, they point out that all it takes is one death, like this thing in Peru, or a psychotic breakdown, some kind of a bad, bad adverse reaction in a clinical trial, a sex scandal, uh, and this could be set, this work could be set back for years. And, and I address this in a chapter in my new book, Changing Our Minds, that I title Mindsets and Mindfields. And here's a quote from veteran uh, UCLA researcher Charlie Grobe about, about this, who's one of, you know, one of the more cautious and thoughtful guys out there, I think. Uh, Charlie says, quote, dissolving boundaries is wonderful in a healthy treatment setting, but not when utilized by power hungry, uh, by power hungry self-centered individual without proper ethical standards. He said, I don't think this is well recognized by the so-called psychedelic community. It's going to have to be addressed as this gets bigger and bigger and more socially acceptable. 
So, I, I mean, I guess the canonization of psychedelics is better than the demonization of these drugs, but this whole dance is something we really need to think about and we can talk about here. Um, I just got a few more, uh, okay with time, a few more minutes? Okay, um, so my new book has a history chapter where I look at the criminal, how the criminalization, uh, the whole process of criminalizing uh, a demonized drug in the United States, and it follows a familiar pattern. Uh, you can look at alcohol in the 1920s, marijuana in the 1930s, LSD in the 60s, STP in the 70s, MDMA in the 80s. It begins with rising use among a social group outside the mainstream, like Irish immigrants drinking in the 1920s. Jazz musicians smoking pot in the 30s, hippies with dropping acid in the 60s, all-night ravers dosing themselves with MDMA in the 80s. There are scandalized media reports, then there's a government crackdown. It's a very familiar pattern. Uh, one of the most infamous examples was the 1936 release of the propaganda film Reefer Madness. How many of you have seen Reefer Madness? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that made it much easier for Congress to pass the Marijuana Tax Act the next year, which effectively criminalized pot in the United States. <laughs> I actually saw that movie. I was an undergraduate at Berkeley in the 1970s at a little art house theater on Telegraph Avenue, stoned on acid. So I have a real memory of it seared into my consciousness. I don't recommend that set and setting for seeing that movie, by the way, uh, but I'll never forget it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Harry Anslinger, who was the U.S. Commissioner of Narcotics in the 30s, the nation's first drug czar, was shamelessly honest about the racist ins inspiration for outlawing marijuana back in the reefer madness days. Uh, I was going to read his comment about pot and darkies and white women, but it's so disgusting, I don't even want to read it. But you can get the idea, right? Um, Three decades after Anslinger, during the Nixon administration, the war on some drugs was a thinly disguised crusade against the youth counterculture, anti-war protesters, and civil rights activists. I will read this quote from John Ehrlichman, one of Nixon's domestic policy advisors, who got honest later in life. He said about the real reason that they pr cracked down on pot uh, in the Nixon years. Look, he said, we understood that we couldn't make it illegal to be young or poor or black in the United States but we could criminalize their common pleasure. We understood that drugs were not the health problem we were making them out to be, but it was such a perfect issue, we just couldn't resist. Nixon's top domestic policy advisor, decades later. There you go. <laughs> um, of course, there's a happy medium between the canonization and demonization of psychedelics. Uh, and I think having an honest and open debate about that is about the promises and the pitfalls of this path uh, towards healing and insight is what we need to be doing. So in closing, uh, we talk about rebranding psychedelics, trying to rehabilitate that word. Well, this is a word some of you may know was first coined. The word psychedelic was first coined in the 1950s by the writer Aldous Huxley and the researcher Humphrey Osmond. Uh, these compounds had been called up to then various things, but the popular term then was psychomimetics meaning they mimic psychosis. And Huxley didn't like that because he thought, well, that's, they actually do more than that. You know, there's a positive side to psychedelics. So they were talking about how to come up with a new word and they would write little poems to each other to uh, try it out in various usage. And they came up with this, this is why we have the word psychedelic. The, the poem was, uh, to fathom hell or soar angelic, take a pinch of psychedelic. So that's how we got the word that we're talking about rebranding today. It was the, the, that, the demonization and the canonization from the, very, from the very beginning. Huxley wrote a book, Heaven and Hell, about these drugs. So um, anyway, thank you very much for your kind attention. Um, uh, a, a quick ad. Uh, my publisher is, is, is out by the elevators, and we'll be selling copies of the book if you want to get it on the way out. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Don. And uh, now we have uh, Sasha Frost, who's uh, joining us from the Beckley Foundation, the other uh, really major sponsor of a lot of the LSD and other research that's been happening. Thanks, Fantastic. Sasha. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the Beckley Foundation, we're based in Oxford in England. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about the uh, media and political landscape in the UK, uh, the challenges that we face, and the opportunities we see for rebranding psychedelics. Uh, so in the UK, at the moment, uh, we have our European neighbors who are making quite uh, progressive strides forward with drug policy reform, with cannabis in particular. And unfortunately, 
in the UK were standing still, if not going backwards, with some of our drug policies. So a, a recent poll of uh, members of parliament said they came out, 58% uh, said they were in favor of legalizing cannabis for medicinal, medicinal use. But that's about as far as they will go. Not very many politicians are openly in favor of drug policy reform. And those that do, they tend to come out after they've left positions of power. And they say this is because it's a high risk, low return pursuit, uh, practically political suicide, some of them are saying. Um, but they also say what would make them change and what would make them be more active, and that's if their constituents are writing to them and telling them they want to see the change. So we see it as our role at the Beckley Foundation to inform that dialogue and furnish people with the arguments to, so that they can demand that change. And on the media side, we have a very polarized media landscape in the UK, which makes for quite salacious headlines quite a lot of the time. Um, so the Daily Mail, uh, one of the large news corporations, sort of dominates, takes a lion's share of the readership along with other newspapers like The Sun. And they often vilify, well, yeah, tend to almost always vilify drugs and drug users. So if we have a quick look at some of these headlines here, what they're very good at doing is creating uh, sticky phrases. So that will simplify fairly complex issues. Um, nitrous oxide is often gleefully referred to as hippie crack. And the directors of the Beckley uh, Imperial Research Program are the drug czar and the cannabis countess. So you can get a feeling, <laughs> you can get a feeling of the, the way things go. And the Sun newspaper at the moment often, the stories that it runs with are the same ones that I imagine were going on in the 60s and 70s, mainly people on acid falling out of windows, people in cults being given acid, and in one particular case, a young man stripping naked and running through a forest thinking he was a tiger. And in a classic case of guilt by association, that article then wanted to, went on to talk about another man, not on LSD, who jumped into a lion's enclosure in a different zoo in a different country, and which ended up in them being shot. But that's how they like to bring things together. Yeah. Um, we do get some positive coverage. We do get um, articles like in The Guardian, um, our 2016 LSD uh, brain imaging study got great coverage. That actually got great coverage across across the board. So it is there, but it's with the Guardian. It's often, we'd say, still within our echo chamber. And this is why we uh, feel the science is so important to reach beyond that echo chamber and then show people the the value of these um, of these substances. Because one way that we feel that these clinics that we so hope to see um, materialize is they're going to be ushered in by people demanding effective treatment and it's the science that's showing them what um, what the psychedelic assisted therapy can do um, so then moving on a little bit to about how we how we talk about this how we talk about um, and we find a balance between the statistics on one side of the science and the drug policy and the human stories which Don was talking about which are so important so we show the value of the research but also the cost of prohibition and so a quick look at the media coverage in a couple countries in the run-up to policy changes, mainly in cannabis, in Ireland and in Australia. Um, yes, here we go. Um, in Ireland and Australia, it was precipitated by a focus on individual stories of tragedy or recovery or suffering. And so you had, in Ireland, you had a mother march 150 miles on the Irish parliament to ask for change so her child could have access to CBD for uh, epilepsy. And she did that twice. And I think the second time it was live streamed and there was a lot of coverage and it, it did precipitate a change. And the same in Australia, there, there was a lot of coverage about, um, from grandparents and parents demanding access to these uh, to cannabis uh, for medicinal use, and it helps to that what this has done is sort of helped to reframe the dialogue and change it from what is often just a crime and punishment uh, rhetoric to saying, well, actually, this is this is another way. This is how it, this is affecting, um, showing the value for uh, members of society, which you often don't, you wouldn't think would happen, seeing what um, how it's covered in, let's say, the Daily Mail or the the Sun. 
Um, so one, going back to the statistics, in the UK in 2016, there were 10 drug deaths a day, 10, 10 drug-related deaths a day, which is an astounding statistic, but doesn't get nearly as much coverage as a mother who's lost her child uh, to an overdose of MDMA, which we've had uh, fairly quite a few in recent years in the UK. And a brilliant campaign, a really important campaign in the UK at the moment is Anyone's Child. And what they're doing is helping to challenge the narrative spin about the harms of drugs and saying, well, actually, it's not the drugs themselves, but it's the drug laws around them which um, can be avoided, which can, where we can avoid these deaths. So they're doing a brilliant job in doing this. And it's, it's not only that it, you have a mother talking about the loss of her child, which is so impactful and so powerful. It's also because it cuts through people's preconceptions because they don't see a hidden agenda there, which coming from a psychedelic research foundation, people think there's, well, they see an inbuilt bias there that we've got an interest in psychedelics being legalized. But these mothers who have lost everything um, can really help to uh, change the dialogue and help to destigmatize um, these, these drugs. So we think it's really important and we try to give a platform to these, um, to these stories and these, these voices that need to be heard. And just changing tack slightly, um, I want to go on to mention something really quickly about um, titles. <laughs> titles. <laughs> so, back when I think when newspapers were sort of um, vendors would holler out the titles on the evening standard for people to buy the papers, they would be sensational, but then people would buy the papers and they'd read them. Whereas now we're coming up against a, an issue where online you have so many titles, so many articles popping up and passing through, sometimes people might not be reading all of them. And my colleague Ben, our communications officer who works at um, IFL, who writes for IFL Science, they noticed this trend and they thought, well, let's put it to the test. So they put this article out, um, which if you click through and read it, it's all about uh, how people aren't reading to the end of articles or reading them at all. But this didn't stop a very uh, heated debate going on on Facebook where they get uh, a lot of the conversation going on about extraterrestrial herb and how NASA has really lost the plot. <laughs> so in a way, I mean, it's, it's, it's humorous, but it's something to consider. People are just only seeing the titles and the only the, um, not everybody is going to take that step further. Then this is, this is something uh, important to think about, um, how, how, that, how that one line how you're um, battling with the idea of clickbait and making people want to read further, and if they're not, then, then what is this doing to inform the dialogue? So I suppose what we're really trying to do is we're just trying to reach as many people as possible and make this research and the policy work, make it relevant to them, and how we're gonna do this is by involving as many people as possible, because the psychedelic renaissance, the, the benefits to, are gonna be different to different people, and that's really important to acknowledge and so what we want to do, we want to collaborate with societies, psychedelic societies, students, filmmakers, podcasters, everybody who wants to join the debate, but more importantly, everybody who wants to bring more people into it. And um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. And uh, I'm very, very pleased to introduce my coworker, Bryce, who uh, has been working with MAPS for about as long as I have and has... Um, been one of the main driving forces behind our explosion on social media and the website, and is the content manager for Maps. So, Bryce Montgomery. Thank you, Brad. Hello, I am so honored to be here, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about my personal experience rebranding psychedelics with Maps. I started at Maps as a social media intern in 2011, and since then, I've gone on to be a full-time staff member, and I manage a couple of amazing people, Amy Mastrini and Kara Lachance. And I think that our team, led by Brad, and includes a few other members, is very consistent, which makes me very proud to be part of this. And our platform where we share is the internet, largely. We used to be a one-page newsletter sent by Rick Doblin 
uh, just in, through the mail and through the use of technology, we're able to reach so many more people now. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. This is kind of a visionary perspective on the way we share on social media. We are on every social media network except for Snapchat. And part of the reason why we approach all social networks, including Pinterest or Tumblr or other places where you would not expect to find psychedelic education is because there are audiences that you know, need to know about the risks and benefits. And rather than just pandering to our crowd that we know will come to a conference like this, we want to reach new people. And we've done that very well so far. And I'm proud to say we have over 200,000 followers on Facebook. Um, does anyone here follow us maps on Facebook? Thank you. Does anyone here follow the Hefter Research Institute on Facebook? And does anyone follow the Beckley Foundation on Facebook or any other network? For anyone that did not raise their hand, please join us and see how we are rebranding psychedelics. <laughs> I'd like to highlight uh, our use of uh, Instagram, which has gro uh, grown exponentially since we launched uh, not too long ago. And we just recently started experimenting with uh, Instagram stories. Amy Mastrini's running around the conference doing so. And a lot of the things we're doing is shining light to this work. And part of the, the, the challenge is word choice and thinking how we can make things as accessible as possible. How can we write posts that will be understood and enticing for the general public beyond our normal audience? So we try to use words like therapeutic, medical, and try to avoid sensationalism. If you follow us on social media, you may know that we are very active. We are posting quite constantly all the time, though we put lots of care and attention into our work. And because of that, I think we are going to move further than we would if we were not as cautious. As Don alluded to, there's sometimes a little bit too much overzealousness, which can take away from this work. So I'm very proud of uh, the kind of style we've crafted between Brad, Kara, and I, and Rick. And uh, we're excited to continue to adapt and see how we can explore these other avenues. I'd like to highlight one very important topic that's very dear to me, and that is choice of words. For example, if you've heard of MDMA, you may know that MAPS is doing MDMA-assisted psychotherapy research as a treatment for PTSD. You may have seen headlines that say, Molly is given to soldiers uh, for PTSD treatment. Headlines like this do a major disservice to our work. And continuing to use these words when referring to a pure known compound is something I think we should all avoid. If you are referring to Molly in reference to MDMA research, I invite you to consider using the scientific phrasing. I think the same thing applies to things like magic mushrooms. I think we should call them psilocybin mushrooms if you're referring to that, or psychedelic mushrooms. There's many other things like that. And for instance, some of the other work that MAPS does is the Zendo project, where we say that difficult is not the same as bad. So rather than saying you had a bad trip, or if someone approaches you saying they had a bad trip, maybe try to reframe it and say, I understand that was a difficult experience, but perhaps you learned something from it and it was not completely useless. Part of my work at MAPS is producing crowdfunding campaign content. Uh, starting with a Zendo project crowdfunding video in 2013, we've produced at least like five solid crowdfunding campaigns that have videos and marketing plans and much more. Um, 
one of the ways we improved was adding branding. Um, going from a crowdfunding campaign title like Healing Trauma in Veterans with MDMA Assisted Psychotherapy versus Legalizing Psychedelic Therapy. That shift, that making it shorter, and more accessible, straight to the point, made that campaign so much more uh, far-reaching than any other of our campaigns. And the Legalizing Psychedelic Therapy campaign had over 1,400 unique donors, which is by far the most amount of donors we've ever received from a single campaign. And a lot of that had to do with a video of which featured Amber Lyon, a former CNN journalist, using her credibility and established celebrity uh, we were able to ride that momentum as an introduction to participant interviews, where the people who have actually received MDMA assisted psychotherapy in a legal context are sharing their experience. And I think that's one of the strongest ways that we can continue to rebrand psychedelics is to listen to the people who are actually legally receiving psychedelics right now in a scientific context and some of them are here this weekend and I invite you to go check out the uh, participant panels. There's an MDMA participant panel and a psilocybin participant panel and hearing how they speak about it, the people who are objectively the authority on what it's like to receive MDMA in a legal context, um, they're doing a great job and I'm so proud of all the participants who have come forward to share their experience because that is the most compelling data that you could possibly receive. I'll close with uh, this photo of uh, Nigel McCurry and Rachel Hope that I took at dinner with them on Thursday. I'm very proud to be friends with some of the study participants through my interviews and learning about their experiences. And one of the main driving forces in my work to make psychedelic experiences more safely accessible for the public is due to meeting Rachel Hope at Burning Man and she came up to me and said, hey, I was a study participant number seven, and it's nice to meet you. And since then, I've visited her and filmed an interview with her, and, and it's just one of the many participants I've gotten to meet, and that's, that's what makes it real for me. I've met these people. They are not numbers on a piece of paper. They are not a participant number. They are real people who have had trauma for most of their lives, and now they don't. And I can confirm it's real. So I'm going to keep going with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bryce. And uh, now we have Mike Levine from the Hefter Research Institute, new uh, communications director with the Hefter Research Institute, the sponsor of a vast majority, if not all of the, um, well, vast majority of the psilocybin uh, trials um, that we've been learning about and we'll be learning about a lot more tomorrow in some of the talks. Great. Can everyone hear me? All right. Thank you, Brad, for the introduction. Thanks for everybody on the panel. It's an honor to be up here with all of you. And thanks to everyone who's, uh, who's listening and, uh, and here. I also want to thank the, the Hefter team, particularly President uh, Dr. Dave Nichols, who gave a talk this morning, if you guys were downstairs, and the medical director, Dr. George Greer. They've been very willing partners in talking about communications as, as long as I've been working with them. And the Hefter board uh, that's been supporting this work, philanthropists and other scientists, has been great to work with. So I want to acknowledge them before I get started. So I, I'd like to start the talk by flashing back a little bit to the studies that were the random control trials that were published in December of last year from NYU and Johns Hopkins. Uh, Don highlighted some of the very positive coverage in his part of the talk. Uh, it's, a, it's a day that we were looking forward to for a very long time. We're very proud of how the coverage turned out. Uh, essentially, the studies found that um, cancer patients who had existential distress and anxiety took a single dose of psilocybin, had a dramatic reduction in anxiety and depression. And uh, there were front page stories in the New York Times. There was coverage in the LA Times, Washington Post. Baltimore Sun, Time Magazine, The Atlantic, too many to name. It was a, a really thrilling rollout of, of, the, of the studies. And it was the culmination of a lot of hard work that had been going on by the scientists for years and also on, on the communication side to prepare for that moment. Um, and I'll 
explain a little bit about how that happened over the next few minutes. But I, I did want to acknowledge um, Don's point in saying that there is some danger in canonization of these substances. I think that is that's a real concern. Uh, I do think that coverage can turn on a dime, and that um, that thinking has underpinned a little bit about how Hefter approaches communications, trying to prepare and really be seen as serious, sober scientists and not advocates. And that is really, uh, I'll get a little bit more into that, but I wanted to, to acknowledge that point because I thought it was a very valid one. So um, when we were talking earlier, um, there was a, a little bit of discussion about the demonization and the Richard Nixon and 1970 and, and the, you know, the prohibition against these, these substances. And that's, in many cases, the way news coverage starts. That's the beginning. But um, I actually think there's an important moment before that, and not just the Army and uh, inhumane LSD experiments, but legitimate science that was happening in the 50s and 60s with uh, you know, dozens of trials, thousands of participants, uh, real encouraging findings to treat alcoholism and other conditions that were happening with LSD and psilocybin way back when. So that was happening before um, the prohibition happened. And often you'll see coverage start with that and then jump immediately to the, the psychedelic renaissance, as the ter term has been used, over the last few years. But again, that, that skips over some important context, some important things that happened in the intervening years. We know that MAPS got started and we know that the Beckley Foundation got started in the 90s, and Hefter was started in 1993, which is a while back, and has been conducting research since then. So it's not just, you know, the papers that were published on December 1st. This has been going on for a long time. And so I, I'd like to point out that Hefter started in 1993, about $7 million in funded research over that time has funded the essentially all of the psilocybin human trials in the United States in that time. And a, a majority of the, the studies in Europe in that time. So there's been a lot of work that's been happening for a while. So the Hefter's portfolio has included um, helping design, scientific review, funding the studies, a whole range of different work from the cancer-related anxiety and depression to addiction uh, for alcohol, tobacco, cocaine. Uh, there's additional work that's happening to understand consciousness, basic science to understand how this works in the brain. So there's a, a wide range of, of research that's happening. Um, so it, it all points to um, Hefter's big mission, which it has two pieces to it. So one is to alleviate suffering, and the other is to understand how the brain works. These are the two big pieces of Hefter's mission. And the reason that we're inspired to do this work is that we see the, the great potential of these substances to have a positive impact on people's lives. That's we see that potential out there, and we think it's been unexplored and not explored to the degree which it needs to be. So that that is the the mission here. And you might hear a slight difference between what Hefter does and what Maps and and Beckley do. And I I think that that um, difference is is meaningful. It's not uh, total, but I think there are some significant differences. So I think it's worth pointing out that Beckley is in favor of legalization, and MAPS does a lot of very important work uh, on harm reduction. And I think these are important things, so I, I want to be clear that I'm not disparaging that work. But Hefter has been very clear that it is not an advocate for legalization. It is stepping away from that debate. It, is, uh, it has been careful to caution against underground or recreational use. It's, it's a distinct position and it's one we've made after some careful thought, and there's a reason for it. There's a communications purpose for that position, and I'll explain that a little bit. Um, so Don pointed out the Rolling Stone article that came out recently. I, I think it's worth highlighting that after we published a blog post highlighting a number of the concerns that we had about the types of therapy that were highlighted in that article. And, and I think that that was a, an important uh, signal from Hefter as to what we believe about the science and what we believe about essentially the communications around the science. So I wanted to highlight that. So um, I, in preparing for this panel, uh, I went back and watched the 2013 discussion about uh, positioning psychedelics. I thought it was fascinating. And one of the, the moments that, I, that really stuck out to me, as I was not yet working for Hefter at that point, was that there was a journalist who was on that panel, and she shared um, a story about when she was writing an article about ayahuasca, and she was going to include a quote from Hefter in that article, and she 
sent it to her editor, and the editor said, who is that? You need to get a real source. And that was, that was the perception of Hefter at that moment in time, and this is four years ago. So it wasn't a given that the positive coverage that we saw in December, which quoted Dr. Greer by name and mentioned Hefter in, in many cases, that was not a given. And so that's why we put so much work into preparing for that moment. And, and you might think, well, what's the problem with anonymity? We're not trying to be famous here, right? We're not, we're not trying to sell anything. So why do you need to be known? And that's a fair question. And, but there's a, a reason for that. There's a reason why we, we care about that. And the answer is funding, right? So the government hasn't funded this work. And pharmaceutical companies aren't going to see the way to profit if there's nothing that they can patent and they can, it's only a single-use medicine. So funding has all come from private sources. And if people don't know that you exist, it's going to be hard for them to fund the work. And so funding has been a bottleneck that has limited the amount of research and the speed of research on psilocybin for years. And if we are passionate about helping people, we need them to know that this is happening. So that, that was uh, why I was brought on in preparation for the NYU and Johns Hopkins papers that were published to make sure that we made the most of that moment, that people became aware of Hefter, became aware of the research, became aware of the moment that had been reached with, you know, phase two complete. We're, we're looking forward to FDA approval here, and we need people to be aware that we're, that we're getting on that path. So um, a little bit of background uh, about me. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not keeping my slides, I'm not keeping up with my, my talking here, so I apologize. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I was a journalist for many years. Uh, I was also a human being during that time. Uh, but... <laughs> But I was a journalist for many years, and I uh, focused on explanatory reporting. I took complex issues, uh, reams of data, and tried to boil them down into comprehensible information that readers could make sense of. That was what I specialized in. And that type of thinking has driven the communications work we've done at Hefter. Um, we're trying to take a very complex issue and make it so that it's understood not just by people in this room who are advocates for and deeply interested in psychedelic science, but other audiences who may not pre be predisposed to be in favor of this, but we think are, are key audiences for us to reach. So that includes FDA regulators, that includes mainstream media, it, it includes um, potential donors who are going to support this work, and it includes potential allies who we think are going to be important as the FDA is considering whether eventually to approve this. We think that's people like oncologists and psychiatrists, people who don't work with psychedelics. We think it's uh, patient advocates, we think it's family members, we think these are, are key audiences that we need to make sure understand what's going on. So that's, when we're writing a blog post about the dangers of underground therapy or, or cautioning against recreational use, we're thinking about some of those audiences when we do that. That's why we do those things. So, um, so among the, the communications work that we've done, we've ramped up Hefter's social media work dramatically um, on Twitter and Facebook. We've written some blog posts like the one that I've described. Um, and we also, we had the medical director, George Greer, go on Reddit in the days after the, uh, the random control trials were published in December to talk about them. There was, he didn't ask me anything, which is among that site's most popular features. And we thought that was a pretty cool way for him to interact uh, with members of the public who may not be in this specific community. And we thought the kind of questions that he got there were uh, illuminating in some ways. So that was a, a positive experience. Um, but again, what we're trying to overcome here is some of the stigma that was left from the, the chemicals escaping the lab in the 60s, some of the uh, skepticism about the work, and we're trying very narrowly to stick to the path where we believe that the FDA approval will come if we are perceived to be serious, sober, careful scientists, not advocates. And that, again, underpins the, the work that we've done on communications. So. That is a slightly different from what some other folks on the stage are, are their theory of change. And I don't think that Hefter has a monopoly on the right ideas. Right? I don't think that like we're doing it right, everybody else is doing it wrong, so get on board. It's more like there's different ways to skin this cat. And I think there are different ways to get to the outcome that all of us are working toward. And this is the one that we're pursuing. And we're pursuing it very carefully and very narrowly. But I do think that there are implications for the work that all of us are doing for, all, for everybody else, right? The work that I'm doing with Hefter has implications for Beckley and for MAPS. The work Don is doing has implications for all of us. And I, the reason I believe that is I think that there's a general perception out there about psychedelics, and we all influence that perception. And so 
if we all contribute to a positive public perception, I think that's a rising tide that can lift all boats, right? That can improve the work for everybody. So there are some uh, kind of shared principles that I think apply to all of our, our work, some shared communications principles. So I, I put them up on the screen behind me. I, I think they're ones that everybody could agree to, but I would be interested to hear if there's any questions or any discussion about them. I think that, I think that they would apply, but I'd love to hear feedback. So the, the first is that these, these medicines have the potential to improve millions of lives. I think we can agree on that as a, a basic principle. I think we can agree that psychedelics are non-addictive. They're safe when they're used responsibly. To me, that's an important distinction. Uh, I think that we can agree that uh, scientific research will help us determine the best medical uses of these compounds. And I think that we believe that uh, scientific research will help us understand the way the human mind works and build that knowledge of ourselves. And I think those are the four key points that I would hope that the general public would take away from all of our work. And I think that would create a supportive environment for um, all the important fights to come. So uh, that's what I hope to leave you with. And I look forward to your questions and discussion. Awesome. Thank you all so much. I believe we have about four minutes for Q&A. Is that about right? Um, great. And I know we're going to have way more, so let's just get started. Do we have mics? Or? Um, hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. Huh. Um, thank you all so much for your work and your presentations. Um, this is a question specifically for the Foundation. So, I understand that funding is a massive, getting funding is a huge bottleneck in this kind of research. Um, but I also see that not being government funded could be a real merit in a lot of people's eyes. Um, and that's coming from Santa Cruz, where there are a whole lot of anti-vaxxers who just don't believe that there's no link between autism and uh, vac vaccines. So my question is, are you, do you want government funding, or are you proud of your lack of government funding? What's the goal? That's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know that we've made it our mission to avoid government funding. I think that uh, my, my impression is that we want to get the research done. And if the government were to fund it, I don't think that would compromise the science that's happening. That That's my understanding of the ecosystem. Whether they're going to or not, I think is an open question. I think FDA approval would clear the path to getting some government funding for future research. Um, and I don't think that we would be opposed to that. But at this point, our understanding is that this is gonna happen because family foundations and private individuals think that this is important and it should happen despite the fact that the government has not funded it. That, that's the place where we are. Um, briefly, uh, uh, one quick observation um, and a quick question. I just haven't heard the term patients groups mentioned much in the last couple of years here, as I hear in more the cannabis community. And the second one, are, are you collectively prepared for when Big Pharma comes with false, false flags to kill what you're doing? Regarding the use of patient, uh, for me that connects to something a little bit more proven medical. Participant means there's no illusion between the fact that we don't know for sure if there's medical potential until we complete all the FDA phase three trials. So that's, that's just my instant reaction to regarding patient and participant. Uh, I think it's a little bit safer and more accurate. It's similar to how we don't necessarily refer to our the treatments as medicines. Medicine usually implies that it has gone through a rigorous government approval process and we're not quite there yet. So that's so I, I would add one thing to that. I think that that's right in terms of participants and trials to date, but I do I I hope that I highlighted that I think patient advocates for people suffering from conditions our, and patients themselves are audiences that we do hope would become interested in this work. We have time for one more. Hi guys. Great. I have uh, 20 years of marketing and branding experience, 10 working for multi-billion dollar um, 
property or something. So the fusion of these interest areas is amazing to me. I have two sort of brand phrases to run by here. One is somebody mentioned that they, ecstasy used to be called empathy. I'm kind of fascinated by that, and I'm curious what you guys think of that as a positioning for MDMA in non-clinical uses. And the second question is around the term of the, the use of the term hallucinogen and just getting rid of that out of the lexicon completely because it's around psychosis and dementia and not mystical experience or clinical benefit. I, I think I heard your question. Thanks. Sure, sure. Uh, one question is about the use of the word empathy versus ecstasy, and the other is about the term hallucinogen uh, and um, if it's possibly loaded um, in a negative way. Uh, all right. Regarding hallucinogen, I feel strongly against it in general, largely because when you think about this psychedelic experience, mind manifesting, to imply that it is not real regarding your personal experience, the feelings you had, the insights you had, to imply that those are fake and received from some sort of outside source, I think does a major disservice to the whole field. And um, regard, regarding the use of word empathy or ecstasy, I think that these are possible traits of these substances, and I don't think we need to necessarily apply a only positive connotation to these substances. Um, what about empathy in a controlled therapeutic environment versus you know, using it at a rave? It's, it may not actually apply in all situations. Um, I think that calling it by its actual name is very, very important, as I stated earlier, and part of the reason for that is MDMA is explicitly not the same as ecstasy and not the same as Molly at a point in time when MDMA was purely available uh, in a recreational scene, uh, it became tarnished and became referred to as ecstasy and had adulterants added to it, et cetera. And from then on, ecstasy did not mean pure MDMA like it used to. And then as Molly crept up and became the new phrase for pure MDMA, it also became tarnished. I feel like ecstasy and Molly are dirty words because they are dirty, adulterated drugs. And I think that if you know that you have a pure substance or you're referring to pure substance in research, we must call it MDMA, must call it LSD, we must call it psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, yeah, words are very important as someone who uses them for a living. Um, and uh, some people think psychedelic is not a good word. I mean, Ralph Metzner doesn't like that word. He said you should use entheogen or intactogen. Um, I use the word psychedelic because it really just means mind manifesting. And, you know, there are categories that people have, like MDMA is not considered a, quote, classic hallucinogen in the category that is used. And it is a very different kind of a substance. Um, but I, I think psychedelic is a word I don't want to give it up. <laughs> and, you know, MAPS uses it very broadly. You work with marijuana, you work with MDMA, you know, you call it psychedelic under that umbrella. And I think, and I think that's fine. And no, the hallucinogen is a loaded word, and it's not a pr most people don't hallucinate. They close their eyes, maybe they see something, but they don't open their eyes and see things that aren't there. And um, but unfortunately, there are like official categories of substances, and the, that's the word that the, the classic hallucinogen is often the word that people use. And it is important to differentiate the differences between the effects that these drugs have. So it, it's a tricky thing. Right. Thank you so much. I believe we are all out of time, but I am sure we are all really happy to continue having these conversations. We're all kind of obsessed with this topic, so it'll be fine. And by, by the we way, I'll be, I'll be giving a talk at 1 o'clock on the stage about my book, if you want to come and talk to me some more down there. Uh. We, we are going to take about a two-minute break to switch to our next speaker, but I can't resist the opportunity to use the microphone to say that Goodman and Gilman's Pharmacologic Basis of Therapeutics, the canonical book on pharmacology in the United States, uses the word psychedelic to describe these drugs. <laughs>